Ronald, everyone's in? Yep. Yeah? Yep, good to go. Okay, fantastic. Okay, good afternoon. Well, um, good afternoon to everybody. Um, I'm my sincere apologies for the delay. I'm currently in the Middle East. Um, I'm doing interviews for students, uh, university interviews as part of my university role. Um, so I have sort of visited a few schools here in, in the Middle East. Uh, and unfortunately, in my hotel, they had a fire alarm drill today. And I have a letter here. <laughs> I'm not sure whether you can see the letter from there saying please accept our sincerest apologies for any disturbance caused to you because of the schedule fire drill um and it was supposed to be finished by the time i had this session today with you uh, so i wasn't planning to be late but uh, my sincere apologies for the delay um okay let's let's uh let's move on quickly um so thank you very much for attending today. Um, and really the session today is going to be how to make successful application to the world's top universities. And this will really be a part two of a series that we've already done um, because part one was to give you, part one that we did a couple of weeks ago, part one was to give you an introduction to what are the challenges, what are the insights around the challenges facing students when they apply to top universities, what are the foresights that we can look into as solutions to those challenges okay so today um, we're going to talk in more depth about some of those solutions in particular in the area of personal statement interview preparation university admissions so today's session unlike the first one for those of you who were part of the first part one of this movie trailer um, and for those of you who were in the part one um now um that was more information so it's like like sort of no interaction really but for today's session i'm really hoping that there's going to be some interaction so i would really encourage you to use your um zoom uh sorry the chat in zoom and i will ask uh, ronald vivian anybody on the call because i can't see the zoom chat as much so if you can please just let me know if anybody has put any comments in so please for the students and the parents i would really urge you to a little bit more interaction today um, I'll be asking you questions, so please do you know put the answers in the chat. Um, so just a quick introduction to OIC. Um, Oxford International College is uh, number one in the UK. Um, the last year grades, when grades were awarded based on standardized external examination, that was in 2019, we were the only school that had above 90% A star to A grades. Um, and we've maintained that position till now. Of course, the last two years has been teacher assessed grades, but equally, we were not mentioned by the Times, the Sunday Times, uh, for the schools that inflated their results uh, because of the teachers assessed grades. And that is huge, huge value, goodwill currency with the university. So we're very pleased that A, we have maintained our position and B, we have created goodwill currency with the universities as well. Um, I'm also the founder of Cardiff Some College, so I'm really great. I'm really grateful uh, for the journey that I've had so far where my educational pedagogical approach has been successful at two schools that has maintained those sort of uh, fantastic results. Um, and of course, now I'm at OIC and we've hit the number one position. Um, so that's just to give you context about the school, a little bit about myself. Um, so I'm the chief education officer at OIC since 2017, and I took OIC, which was an unranked school and made it number one in just two years. Um, and if you look at the whole journey since 2004, um, and topping the league table in 2010, after it became a school in 2008, um, and consecutively maintaining that position till now, uh, no other school in the history of British education has ever achieved that, in particular maintaining that top results. Uh, normally schools fluctuate year by year. So, you know, it's really pleasing to see that our educational pedagogical approach really does work. Um, I teach chemistry and biology, so that's my background, but I take great passion in career development. Um, so I take great pride in our university uh, process, university journey and in particular, the career development for our students. And for that reason, I work very closely with top universities worldwide. I also sit on interview panel for a number of medical schools, um, and I work very closely with lots of departments um, in other career groups as well. As I said earlier on, I'm also the founder of Cardiacism College. I won the Best Science Tutor of the Year Award in 2011. I received my award from David Cameron, who was the prime minister at that time. Um, I also won the Welsh Woman of the Year for Education, Welsh 
Welsh Asian Women of the Year uh, for Education in 2015. And also in the same year, I won the Class Nobel Educator of Distinction Award, which is given by the Nobel family. And I did a TEDx talk in 2016, and the TEDx talk was about education reforms. So that's about my uh, journey so far. As I said, I take great pride in our admissions record. So the last 10 years, I have sent over 400 students, more than 400 students into G5 universities. So Oxford, Cambridge, LSE, Imperial College London and UCL, University College London, and over 500 students admitted into medical schools. Um, and why do I take great pride in this university admissions record? Because first of all, these numbers represent international students. And as you know, international students it's the bar is a lot higher as as an international student myself i'm from malaysia coaching i came to the uk to do my a levels and went on to university to study natural science and then you know went into education um uh, by chance um uh but it's great to see that despite the odds you know the kids are doing really well because the 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 the, the bar against international students are very very high number one number two um, if you look at the level of competition for the courses that our students apply to, it's less than 10% acceptance rate. Uh, when you compare to other courses, for example, theology, if you want to do theology at Oxbridge, then that's 50% acceptance rate. So when you look at those statistics, it's really, really, um, uh, it's heartwarming to see that the kids have done really well, considering that some of our students, you know, if you look at our um, number of students that come to us, uh, some of them don't have G. GCSE, some, some of them have GCSE, some of them um, have um uh, some of them have, you know, the the sort of were top students in their school and some of them haven't, you know, so it's really individual journeys of those students. Uh, we've also had a 100% success rate to Russell Group Universities in the UK and 100% success rate into Ivy League universities. Just this year, we've had offers to Berkeley, UCLA, um, we've had offers to UPenn and the previous years we've had Harvard, MIT, um, UPenn, uh, Berkeley, Brown, Dukes. So we're also getting students into US universities as well. Generally, our students apply to top universities worldwide, normally it's top um, 50 in the world. So that's why I take great pride in the admissions record. So that's enough about me. Um, and I'm going to share with you also the university admissions record again, just to share with you that success of our st students. I would like to share some stories of our students so that you can then understand the journey that you need to embark on. First of all, let's start with 2022. As of 10th of March, I mean, it's 25th of March now, so the numbers have obviously gone up. Um, but as of 10th of March, these were our uh, university destinations. But can I just say that is really important to acknowledge as per the first session. So if you attended the first session, you will know from what I was saying that this is a very, very tough year in terms of a number of applications or number of offers being made. Universities are making less offers than they ever have had in the decade. So whereas in previous years, they would make times two to times five offers per place this year they're probably they're making times two or even some cases times one offer per place and the reason why there's a shift if you recall from the first session the reason why there's a shift is because a there's deferred entries uh due to the pandemic effects so students have had to be deferred to the default to the next year um also number two is the teacher assess grades the grade inflation i mean we saw grades going from 25 percent a star to a to 50 percent a star to a grades in just three years so so due to the great inflation, the universities are just worried about the quality of the candidates and the degrees they're going to come out with. And that is why they're not making as many offers as they used to. And of course, you know, it's also economics. They don't have the space to fill in um the the students that they've had to take on uh um due to the pandemic due to the deferred entry so um there is a behavior change there's also a change a shift a direction to really help students from uh, underprivileged background compared to students who come from the privileged background and international students of course come under that category but also the other problem is there's huge demand from international students wanting to go to top universities 
capacity. So the demand and supply is completely skewed. And there's huge demand because obviously, rightfully, people are saying that, they, you know, if they're going to spend time and resources, they want to get into a top university. So due to all that reason, this year was the toughest year ever in terms of university application. And we're very pleased that 12 students got into Oxbridge, uh, international numbers. Again, you know, when you look at home numbers, home is a lot more uh, straightforward compared to international students. Um, we've had 10 out of the 10 spaces that were available this year to new students for medicine. We had four of them got into medicine, um, 38 to G5, 238 universities offers worldwide, including the Ivy League in the US as well. And of course, this was of 10 of March and numbers would have grown by now. Um, uh, but we will know the full total in, in May once all the um, offers come in. In 2021, 55% of our students had straight A stars in all subjects and A levels. And again, as I said earlier on, we were not listed by the Times for a school that inflated their results, which I think it sort of shows you the credibility of those results. Um, uh, so 2021 top university destinations. Again, you can see the list of universities that our students went. 2021 was also very difficult year uh, in terms of uh, university application, but 2022 has been really the toughest of all. And we are seeing this pattern are gonna, is going to last for another at least two to three more years. So the level of competition until it goes back to some normalcy after that. Um, and um, yeah, so again, in 2020, 2019, when there was no effects of the pandemic, you can see again our uh, university destinations. So 2020, we had 50% to Oxford success rate, 32% to Oxbridge, 58% to G5, 63% to LSC, UCL, 85% non-medicine, 24% medicine, Imperial, 55 and 14. The reason why there's a differentiation between non-medicine and medicine is purely because non-medicine does not have a government cap, whereas medicine has a government cap of 7.5%. But saying that, though, even for courses that students apply to Imperial and UCL, we still have um, people applying with less than 10% acceptance rate uh, for all their courses. So again, it gives you an idea of um, uh, the success rate there. And again, 2019, 100% medical school, 100% Russell Group, 75% A-star, AA or better, 60% Cambridge Imperial LSE UCL, and 25% Cambridge University. Of course, these uh, 2019 and 2020 were the years where there was no pandemic effect or there was nothing that sort of had affected uh, with the level that we are seeing right now. And this level of this challenges are going to continue the next few years. Um, okay, now, again, what is the best way to deal with um, the, the whole, you know, so how do you prepare yourself for top university? First of all, you have to first of all, discover your passion. So that's number one. So we normally place students into three categories, healthcare and biological science, physical science and mathematics, social science, humanities and commerce. Now you will find that these three courses covers at least 90% of all courses at universities. Of course, it doesn't cover things like fine art or music and so on, but those are very specialist courses. Uh, but these three career groups would generally cover almost all courses. So let's look at the healthcare and biological sciences. So whilst I'm talking, I'm going to be giving you some context as well uh, whilst we're seeing this slide. So as you can see on this slide, so these are students from our college who have been very successful in getting offers. But the couple of things to take away. Number one, uh, look at the number of subjects they're doing. They're not all doing the same number of subjects, which tells you that you is very personalized journey. You have to remember that um, when you write your personal statement, when you go for your interview, it's really an expression of your journey. So the more the better your expression of your journey is, the more likelihood you will get those offers. So expression of your journey is what's key here. All right. So again, another thing to take away from this slide is that um, so besides the number of subjects is that students have applied for scholarships. So there are people here. So Ziswen, for example, had a full scholarship. And then there are others who've had partial scholarships as well. So application to scholarship can be done in parallel to your university application, but it does require for you to write another personal statement and you may be called for interview as well. So that could be in parallel. So those two things to take away from every of these sections anyway. 
anyway. But very important, the most important thing that I would like you to take away from this slide, healthcare and biological science, is for you to identify actually what in this category are you interested in? Because there's so many different courses. There's medicine, there's dentistry, there's veterinary medicine, there is um, you know, biomedical sciences, natural sciences, biological natural sciences, biochemistry. So it's really important to understand, do you have an interest in life sciences as a research, as a theory, or do you have an interest uh, in the clinical aspect, which is like medicine, dentistry, veterinary, pharmacy, and so on. So that's the first thing I would like you to write down somewhere that where is it? Is it the clinical sciences or is it the research, the theory, the concept? If it's the research, the theory, the concept, then you're looking at something like biomedical sciences, biochemistry, natural sciences. If it's to do with um, um, sort of uh, clinical aspect, then of course you're looking at more clinical, more practical element. Uh, the other thing as well to bear in mind, uh, yeah, besides the clinical versus theory, um, is also, are you more interested in the course or the university. So for example, we had a student who said, look, I'm just interested to apply to certain universities. So we then said, rather than medicine, which has a 7.5% cap, you might want to consider natural sciences, biological or biomedical sciences or biochemistry. So again, you just have to also think, is it the course or the university that uh, mostly that really matters. Normally I find for healthcare and biological science career groups, the kids already know what they want. You know, is it medicine? Is it dentistry? Sometimes they don't know whether it's really medicine, but they want to do research. So they're pretty clear in that direction. So there's not much confusion around it. Most of the time, the bigger confusion is whether medicine is really right for me. And that's where you have to do a lot of super curricular activities like work experience to really affirm your career choice. Now let's look at the second career group, physical science and mathematics. So that covers computer science, mathematics, engineering. Again, the thing to take away from this slide, um, number of subjects are different, um, people applying for scholarships as well. So those are the things to take away from this slide, similar to what I've just said for the career group before that. So again, for this career group, you then have to decide what area of physical science and mathematics you're really interested in. Okay, so is it mathematics? Is it engineering? Is computer science? What is it, right? Now, I would say this, if you are um, a mathematics enthusiast and you love mathematics and you're very good at it, then yes, apply for mathematics or computer science. But if maths is not your, um, if you enjoy maths, but you don't eat, sleep, breathe maths, then don't apply for maths degree. Because mathematics, um, so the difference between the first career group, right, for this one, for medicine, dentistry, veterinary, it almost doesn't matter which university you get in, because you will end up being a doctor, um, a vet sort of thing, you, it really doesn't matter, it's very, it's very easy to get from zero to four offers for this career group. But when it comes to physical science and maths career group, if you want to do a maths degree, my advice to you is to go to some really good maths department or computer science department because then you're, you will be taught with quality, um, you will have lots of different exposure in terms for the future, um, and I think the name of the university and the quality of the education you get will be very important for this career group. But saying that, you really need to understand, are you a maths like, you know, do you love, do you eat, sleep, breathe maths? If you do, then maths and computer science are fine. If you don't, then I would advise you to look at engineering. I'm not saying engineers don't have to eat, sleep, breathe maths, but uh, there's less context to it compared to maths and computer science. Um, and engineering uh, is more maths, physics, you know, there's different elements to it. So do think about what's your natural affinity. Um, so for this career group, normally they look at how much projects you've taken part in, wider reading that you have done, but it's really the projects, the hands-on, on the sort of the level of passion you have for physics and so on. Again, you can apply for scholarship. As you can see, some students on this slide here have applied for scholarship and had achieved full scholarship. Okay, next career group. Again, you can see from the slide, different number of subjects successful into getting into certain universities um, uh, with different number of subjects. And again, you can see the scholarship element on this present on this slide as well. Now, what's very important on this slide, on this career group, 
uh, is very broad. This is a very, very broad career group and the courses, there are so many different courses. Um, it's like it's a minefield to start off. So this is the area that you need to be a little bit more strategic. And again, you have to decide, is it the course or the university? Because if it's the university, that again, you might want to look at which ones have a better success rate. Um, which courses have a better acceptance chances. If it's really the course, that's fine. Um, but if it's not, if it's the university, and it doesn't matter which course, as long as it's, you know, so for example, economics, right? You have pure economics, you've got economic tricks, you have economics and management, you have land economy, uh, then you have so many different types of economics, you know, politics with economics, philosophy with economics. Um, there's so many different types. And then you've got psychology, philosophy, and linguistics. So there's so many different types combination obviously law is very different um if you have an interest to learn about law not necessarily about practicing law but to learn about law then law is good for you um because i don't like you saying in the interview that i want to be a i want to do law because i want to be a lawyer um, so this is a very broad, so this is the thing that you really got to get your head around, whether it's the course or the university. Once you decide that, once you work out that answer to that question, then it's much easier to work out, right, which, you know, what course that you want to do. Okay, now let's move on to where we're going to start some interaction here now. So personal statement. What is the personal statement? It's a 4,000 character essay. It's used as part of your application to university. It's your chance to sell yourself. Although I'm going to put some caveat around personal statement today, there has been some discussions on how they're going to change personal statement. I'm not sure whether it'll come in for this year, but they may make changes next year or the year after. There's going to be a consultation period around personal statement. And the reason why they're changing some of this aspect is because um, they are really pushing to help children from underprivileged backgrounds. So that's why they're changing some aspects of the personal statement. What it would look like, they will have to go through consultation before we can see that. So for now, as of now, if you're applying for this year, this is the methodology. Even if you're applying for next year, I'll probably stick with this for now until we get until we get uh, new information around what will be happening with the personal statements. Uh, because then, even if they change it to meet um, to help the underprivileged kids, uh, international students, and you know, students who come from a privileged background, probably will still have to step up their game um, to make sure that they are able to present their journey in a way that needs to be so it's really important that you sell yourself and how you sell yourself is going to be an expression of your journey okay and your expression of your journey cannot be whatever your parents give you on a on a plate you will have to demonstrate your journey because you can't what i tell my students is you can't change uh, the background you come from, right? You can't now say I'm, you know, you are on your own journey. The key thing is not um, to demonstrate something that's given to you on a, on a silver plate. It's, it's really to demonstrate that journey, you know, to demonstrate how much have you fought for your ambition, you know, and that's, that's key. So what is the personal statement used for? Uh, so it's called to call you for an interview to help decide what questions to ask you at the interview. And of course, excellent personal statement may help you in borderline cases as well. Um, what are the admissions tutor looking for? You need to convince them that you're the right person. For top universities, they're looking for people who will thrive in an academic environment. Personal statement has to be academic or super curricular. That statement at the bottom, the percentage is incorrect. It should be 80% or 90% super curricular and around 10 to 20% uh, extracurricular or other information. Can anyone tell me and put it on the chat, please? Why do you think it's an 80%, 90% supercurricular academic and 10%. What, why do you think, what, why, why not the extracurricular? Because, you know, you know, you've done great A piano. Why isn't that important? As in not important, but why isn't that given the same kind of percentage to your academic or supercurricular? Can anyone put that in the chat, please? I'm just going to go on Zoom. Yeah, can I ask if people can please put in the chat? 
come on guys let's 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 get some points here why do you think it's an 80 versus 80 90 versus uh 2010 there's got to be a reason Supercurricular, Ashlyn and Chloe, thank you very much. Supercurricular can help you to understand and experience the career path you want to follow in the future. Yes, that's correct. So now I would like to think that you are the admission tutor. So why is um, an extracurricular, why is the fact that you have done great at piano or you played football for national level, why, isn't, why wouldn't that be something that the admission tutor will be like, wow, this is impressive. You played football. Well, national level, it seems a bit <laughs> too far fetched, but let's say you played football for your teams and everything. Why isn't that going to be something? Because the basis of and uh, foundation of any tertiary education sits with the depth of one's pre academic knowledge. Um, agreed, but let, let's make it, let's break it down um, from an admissions tutor. What do you think they want from this 80 20 split or 90 10 split? So, what is it? What is within the 90%? that you think? Give me some examples of what you think they would want to see. So for example, a well-balanced person, okay? So how do you demonstrate you're a well-balanced person? Remember that admission tutors are looking for people who are passionate about their course, right? People who are passionate about their course, you really want to do medicine. If you want to do maths, you are breathe, sleep, breathe, you know, eat, sleep, breathe um, maths. So to try and ensure the candidates can cope with the course right to the end. Yes, that's correct. They want students to be able to study well, but also have a passion for a certain hobby. Um, to try and ensure the candidates can cope with the yeah uh, they want to know whether you're dedicated to the course or not that's correct they want students but also have super curricular directly related to career passion and future job success okay so what they're looking for really is they if you've done grade eight piano right which is brilliant you've done great at piano fantastic now the point is if you want to do engineering if you want to do medicine then you need to be able to demonstrate how does the grade eight piano actually helps the helps you to reaffirm your career choice that's what's important right because um you know so it's not that the extracurricular is not important it's not that playing football is not important it is of course important it's your it's what makes you as an individual it gives you character it gives you personal development and you need to have character if you don't have character you're not going to survive at university you know you're not going to survive in the world let alone university so you have to demonstrate but the key thing is how do you present how do you express your journey of the things that you have done that you can link it to your um to your career so for example if you're a head girl or a head boy yes you have leadership um leadership um qualities to become a head girl and head boy but how does that relate to your passion or wanting to do medicine uh, or your teamwork for example well teamwork is really important in medicine right engineers need to have good teamwork so you have to demonstrate that but if you want to do mathematics at university do you need to show teamwork does teamwork actually contribute to your um passion well it could be because you could be taking part in a competition in a maths competition and in the maths competition it could have been a maths relay and therefore you had to work in a team so that could be an expression of your journey in that sense so it's not that the extracurricular is not important is that how does that extracurricular how is that super, you know super curricular is a direct link your extracurricular how does that relate to your cause so there's a bit of a thing every time when i you know i'm like i said i'm in the middle east right now and when i and a lot of people here are applying to uk and us and they always talk about US really likes to extracurricular, whereas UK doesn't. But actually, it's not true. It's not that the UK doesn't like extracurricular. UK wants to see um, what is your passion and therefore demonstrate evidence to your passion. If you can demonstrate that from your extracurricular, that's that's great. But, you know, again, the context has to be has to be clear. So that's brilliant. Thank you. So what is what is it that is not important um, in your uh, what is it that's not important in your, um, you know, in terms of uh, your personal statement? It does not matter how long ago you made the decision to study the course. But be careful with this, though. If you said, 
I always wanted to be a doctor from the age of five. I mean, that's a bit of a cliche, isn't it? From the age of five to be a doctor. What can you what can you be doing at the age of five that made you want to do medicine? I had a boy who wrote in his in a personal statement at the age of five, he used to dissect fish. Um, and he loved that dissection so much that he wanted to be a vet. <laughs> so I was just like, when I read his personal statement, I was just like, do we really want to say that? Although saying that though, he got into Cambridge for veterinary medicine, um, but we did change the, the personal statement. So it does not matter how long ago you made the decision to study the course, but again, you have to really contextualize, um, you know, what triggered you. And please, whatever you do, don't be, don't put down any cliche like, you know, I want to be an engineer because I enjoyed building Lego. Um, you know, which is great. Lego is fantastic. I mean, I have a nine-year-old boy who loves Lego all the time, but if I was going to write his personal statement that builds on Lego, then it has to have a lot more context to that. Extracurricular activities only matter in the context of the relevant skills you learn, as I mentioned earlier on. That's really uh, what is down to. Okay, now um, let's look at what will show that I am the right person, okay? So how do we show, don't tell? Right, what is the difference between showing and telling? Can anyone tell me examples of what does it mean by show and don't tell? So when, I, when we say show and don't tell, give me an example of a show and, a, uh, and tell. Sounds like I'm doing an English class at the moment. <laughs> but yeah, just examples of show and don't tell. Anyone would like to try? So what would show be? So if I was to show you something, not tell you something, what is the difference? Actions speak louder than words. So for example, instead of say, saying you have leadership qualities, show your leadership by being a president of a club. Yes, that's right. Describe the thing instead of just saying it out. Okay. Yeah. Anything else? What other examples of show and don't tell? Show evidence, describe, not tell what you think. Okay. Susan, yep, show indirectly. Walk the talk in simple terms. Good grades and the relevant subjects will show. Well, when we're looking at personal statement, there's nothing in your personal statement should be about your grades because your grades is already part of your education qualification section and your teachers obviously will talk about your academics and your reference. So your personal statement should not mention anything about your grades. But in your personal statement, how do you show and don't tell? Well, the first thing is uh, never put a list out. Nobody's interested in a list. Um, this is not a CV. If they wanted a CV, they would have asked you for a CV, but it's not a CV. So it's really an expression of your journey. But how do you express your journey by showing and not telling? Well, show is really taking part in activities and showing them that your your participation in these activities demonstrate your passion. For example, when you go to an interview, you know, they're not going to ask you directly in every question, tell us about your work experience, tell me about yourself. They're not going to ask you that. But whilst they're asking you their questions, especially in a general interview compared to a subject specialist interview, but when they ask you in a general interview, every time that you give an answer, you can always bring in the work experiences you have done, the books you have read. You can always bring those things as examples to your journey. So yes, Abby, able to articulate the journey in detail, even showing something or able to explain with passion. Yeah, so articulating the journey, it's more of your communication skills, but it's really showing showing means from a content point of view, you are showing, I'll give you an example. So um, how do you show, I'll give you a simple example. How do you show you have won something without saying I won it because I won it is the list. I won this, I did this, I did that. That's a list, right? How do you show that? The way to show it is it has to subtly come into place 
by doing a theme, a theme of your journey, right? So you start off by talking about, okay, so this is my, you know, I this is what triggered me um, to wanting to study engineering. This is what I understand about engineering, and that's why I'm passionate about doing that. And uh, I, you know, I have picked up skills through doing a project uh, that I took part in last year, and you know, and I won in this project. My team and I won this project. Uh, we came first, but the challenges that we had to go through, uh, and then you describe the challenges so that it sounds like there's a whole journey. Yes, you won, but the winning is not as important as the journey, but you know, or as equally as important. As journey and that's how you subtly show things so it has to be a theme it has to flow so let's look at the the the, the tips uh, around this so um, tip one show the right motivation academic for example i'm fascinated to learn how humans regulate their behaviors through various legal systems i i aim to become a corporate lawyer well first of all i wouldn't say that i aim to become a corporate lawyer because you should never specify a particular thing you can talk about it in an interview but not in a personal statement um one sentence demonstrates academic interest and the other sentence demonstrates vocational practical interest um so the first one will be more Oxbridge style or UCL and Imperial, uh, UCL and LSE. The second one, I aim to become a corporate lawyer that could apply to most Russell Group universities for law. But definitely the first one is more for Oxbridge or the G5 universities, because what you're saying is I'm fascinated to learn how humans regulate their behaviors through various legal systems. So that is how you show that you want to study law, not just becoming a lawyer. Right. So that's because for law, they want to see that for medicine is different medicine. They want to know you want to be a doctor for engineer. You know, you have an interest in science and physics and you want to build stuff and become an engineer. But for law, it's really about the study of law. Well, economics, for example, in economics is a theoretical subject. There's no vocational route with um, uh, economics. So they want to show they want you they want to know that you really have a passion to study economics. Um, so what will show, so show the right evidence that you will thrive in a highly academic environment, reading academic texts and articles, reading introductory books on the subject, although it is not a great starting point, it is not sufficient for competitive courses. So for example, um, for economics, econ for economic students, right? You probably, I don't know whether you've come across a book called Freakonomics. Now, Freakonomics is a great book to read. However, it's a basic book for economics. So it's really, how do you go to the step above? How do you show a level above to demonstrate that you have an interest in your academic texts and articles? Uh, demonstrate the right evidence of your passion for the subject. You know, you don't have to say, I am passionate. You know, even in an interview, I am passionate. You don't have to say that. It is so much more valuable not trying to prove something by saying it, but proving it from your journey, from your, your actions that you've taken part in, right? Um, so, and show why this course is right for you. So why do you want to be a doctor, not a nurse? That's a quite classic example of a question in an interview, because at the end of the day, um, you know, they're both caring profession. So why a doctor, not a nurse? A doctor, you have to solve problems. So maybe you have a problem solving uh, skill sets and that's what you're interested in. Why are you applying for PPE and not economics? Why are you interested in politics, philosophy and economics? You seem to have done more on economics. So why are you interested in that and not pure economics? And it could be because yes, whilst you have been doing A-level economics and you like economics, um, you also understand the need for that link between philosophy and politics and give them examples of how those links trigger you and perhaps the things that you have read uh, that has impacted your country or globally um, and give examples of those impact that you have seen and how that really bothered you when you started to academically question some of the things or some of the theories that you have read um, and that's how you answer that question okay now um key points so really really important make it personal you're writing your story do not make things up they will catch you out uh they have done 
done this a long time. I have seen many people who try to write somebody else's story and it never, ever, ever works, especially now they're looking to change the personal statement anyway. Um, avoid famous people's quotes unless useful analysis. This says nothing about you. Don't try to be cliche. You know, Mahatma Gandhi said this, Malcolm X once said this. You've got to be, it's got to be really uh, have some context. Otherwise it's a cliche. Make important information clear and easy to extract. You don't want anything of value to be missed. Um, and of course, don't ever, 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 ever copy. There's a plagiarism software on UCAS, so never copy previous alumni or even your brothers and sisters if they have been successful, never copy their work. <laughs> Even if you copy phrases, it could be picked up by the UCAS um, uh, plagiarism. So use British spelling. Um, um, yeah, please. The, the British people are very, very, very uh, particular about pedantic about this. Uh, they don't like the American spelling. So please use British spelling. Avoid meaningless word. Um, I noticed one thing that as a Malaysian, uh, we are very used to using really honestly, very, uh, these strong adjectives, <laughs> you know, um, uh, and they just don't like it. So try to avoid meaningless words. Avoid flowery language and big words. They, I mean, I have come across students who write with big flowery words, words that they don't even understand, uh, how you're going to present that in the interview, God knows. So really try to avoid flower, flowery language and big words. Do not mention a particular university because your university, your application is going to go to five universities. Of course, if you have taken part in a summer school in Oxford University or summer school in LSE, that's fine. You can put that context that I've took part in the summer school. And this is what I gained or this is what I learned from it. But um, don't mention that you're going, you want to go to a particular university. Uh, be mindful about mentioning the, the course, particularly if applying for double degrees or differently named courses. Now, especially for economics related courses, because there's so many different options, because you could be ending up applying to five different courses um, uh, on your UCAS form. It's quite important to sometimes specify your course, but be careful doing that. For example, if you apply for politics and economics, and LSC, and you applied for PPE at UCL, and you said in your personal statement you want to do PPE, then LSC PE will reject you. So, you know, because these top universities, they want people who really want to do their course, right, who are diehard fans of their course. So be careful if you're looking at those kind of combinations, you can get caught out by that. Um, okay, right. What will help? Tips one. So what can you do right now to help you with your personal statement? First of all, any supercurricular activity you do, work experience, writing a, blog, uh, uh, a wider reading, voluntary work, projects, competitions, whatever supercurricular activity that you already do, write short summaries of them. So do write a blog. And if you can write a blog based on these four structure, so what facts have you learned? How has it changed your perspective? Does it support or contradicts your previous knowledge? Do you agree or disagree, especially if it's a article that is debatable, especially for economics or law. Uh, what do I want to explore further? So if you go through these four steps and you start writing your blogs, you will have so much rich content by the time you apply to university that you can then start choosing and selecting the best ones. And that's what coaching will help you. So if you were to get coaching around your personal statement, then what will happen is you can then select the best rich content for your personal statement and for your interview. But the more the, if you can start writing the blog, that really does help. Um, what will help? Obviously, like I said, write a work experience diary, write a blog, reflect on the skills um, based on the four structures that I've just mentioned. So for example, if you were to do in this table, so experience, skills, gain, link to your course and career, evidence of skills. So experience, you did one week at Oxford University Hospital. What did you do? All right, visited various departments, described the whole thing in detail, put down the case studies that you have observed. Um, then what was the skills you gained? Maybe you saw good communication, poor communication. Uh, link it to your course. Why is communication important? And then Talk about, do you have communication skill? That's your evidence. That's where the extracurricular comes into place as evidence for your skill. Um, or you could be reading a book. 
So what is the opinion on the book or the article? What do you agree on? You know, what, what is your opinion on that theory or the concept or whatever the article is about? Analyze what you have read, offer a comparison of an argument from another source, um, link to your course and career. How has this particular article reaffirmed your career choice wanting to do law or, or that you want to study more about it at university? And do you have the skill to analyze? Do you have the skill to really argue these things? Well, it could be essay competitions that you've taken part in, um, which gives you context to academic questioning, right? So that's in terms of um, personal statement. So when to start? Well, ASAP, never uh, too early to start. Um, and it's okay if you have so much content, because then if you can get coaching, if you can get somebody to guide you, uh, um, I normally guide my students to then select the best things to what will make their journey stand out. Remember, you only have like 20 minutes to really impress somebody, right? In anything you do in life, you have 20 minutes to impress somebody uh, because people don't have time. People are busy. People have got lots of things happening. So you've got 20 minutes to make an impression, sometimes even less. So 20 minutes, whether it's writing or whether it's interview. Interview normally less than 20 minutes, you've got to, you know, to make impression. I know this is hard core um, thing, but it's the reality, okay? People are distracted people have got lots of things happening in their lives um so it's really important that in 20 minutes or less than 20 minutes what can you ooze out to them you know really attract your audience and if you can do that in less than 20 minutes 10 minutes at least or 10 to 15 minutes then that's that's key and then you've got to take up the, the, the best thing. So this is why sometimes parents come to me and they say, my child didn't get into top universities or they didn't get into this and all that. I mean, they could be the best student ever, right? You could be straight A stars um, in your GCSE, straight A stars in A levels, done all sorts of fantastic things. But when it comes to strategy, um, sometimes you don't get through because it's a lack of strategy in terms of what you present. How do you present? What do you say um, and that presentation is the the basically the you know the, the end game really because um you know it's everything that you have done your journey how do you present that that i think is, is quite crucial there um so i am going to now move on to um i want to talk about interviews as well let me just ooh. Sorry. Right, I want to quickly go through interview preparation as well. Um, I want to look at commonly asked questions. So general questions is, how would you describe yourself? What are your main interests? What are your strengths and weaknesses? So, so I'm going to ask the audience. Um, what do you think the last question what are your strengths and your weaknesses what how do you think one should answer that so what do you give as your strength and your weaknesses So if I wanted to show something, could I put in my certificate showing the extra curriculums I have taken? Uh, you can't upload any certificate on UCAS. So the only thing you can do is either put down on your education qualification section or you um, or you write that in your personal statement or your reference. You cannot upload any certificate. Um, yeah, so that's the only thing you have to bear in mind. Uh, strengths that would make you seem more compatible to your career path. Okay, so yes. So what are your strengths and your weaknesses? Yes, you can make your strengths more uh, compatible. So that means you can make it directly linked to your particular career path. That's a good one. But how do you deal with weaknesses? And how many weaknesses should you give? So what are your strengths and your weakness? So how, how many weaknesses should you give? Any idea with that? So how many weaknesses should you give? Strength depicted by skills um, and practices. Weakness is what my mom always highlights. Um, okay. Uh, maybe a two one strength to weakness ratio. No, I would I would always just give one weakness and try to put across your weakness, which is also 
positive. So for example, it could be something like, um, you know, I take a longer time in, in, in providing my work because I'm a perfectionist, you know, because that's a weakness in terms of taking longer time, but then you're still positive with a uh, perfectionist. So try to think of a weakness that could be positive as well. Of course, I mean, I can sit here and tell you that you've got to be honest in your interview, but unfortunately, um, you know, the reality is, yes, you must always be honest, uh, but honesty can also come with a little bit context as well, right? So so that's something, that's how I, I would say the best way to answer that question. Um, so just going back on to um, general question, let's look at interest and motivation. So what have you enjoyed most about your current studies? Why have you chosen to study this degree course? What aspects of the course interest you most? What skills will make you a successful student of this course? What do you hope to accomplish by studying? Now, a lot of these questions are very similar in context. So they're not going to ask you all of that. Probably they're just going to ask you one. The one that always comes across is, of course, why, have, why do you want to study medicine? Why do you want to study engineering, law, and so on? What do you think is the best way to answer something with why? What do you think is the best way to answer something with why medicine, why engineering, why law, why e economics, why anything, <laughs> you know, why? Any ideas? <laughs> with a reason that does not involve others' opinion. For example, not saying because my brother does medicine. Okay. Reflect your thought using experience from working experience, yes. But, but using working experience is an example. It doesn't answer the question why. Motivation to do the course, yeah, uh, agreed. But then you have to give context. Talk about your passion and what motivated you, okay. Right, so why something is really down to two things. Number one, what is that, what does that course mean to you? I'm not talking about dictionary meaning, but what does it mean to you? So what does it mean to be an engineer to you? What does it mean to be a medicine for you, for, to be a doctor for you? What does it mean to be an architecture for you? Right, that's the first part to the question why, is what does it mean to you? The second part to that question, the second part to the answer is what was your trigger that got you thinking about this. So this is where you'll start looking at your life journey, really, right? So what does it mean to you? So what does engineering mean to you? And what was that trigger? So it's really what to answer why, right? Um, so then you can bring in your examples, like work experience, wider reading and all that. Those are examples. Those are not what it means to you and what was the trigger. And the trigger could be a personal trigger. Um, definitely not don't try to bring in um, the fact that you've got family members doing it, which is fine, but then you have to then also contextualize to, uh, to that you have learned everything about that, um, about that degree, that course, so the, the negative and the positive. So if you said, you know, my father's a doctor and I, that's, you know, um, that's, you've got to really go into the depths of both the positives and the negatives of the course. But I would, I would try to avoid it if you can, if you are, have rich in content and I would just stick with what does it mean to you? And uh, so what and what? So what, what does the course means to you and what triggered you? So that's how you would answer why, the question why. Okay, let's move on to the next question. Uh, working with others. So do you belong to any teams, clubs or groups? If yes, what do you like the most least about this? If no, can you give an example of working alongside others? When you make decisions, what importance do you give to the opinions of others? So again, here, what they're looking for is really teamwork. So the best answer, the best way to answer teamwork, any questions about leadership and teamwork is to really talk about challenges. What are the challenges you face? How did you overcome the challenges as a team or as a leader and go through the challenges. The challenges is a lot more exciting. Being a problem finder and a problem solver is more exciting than knowing that you're a head girl, okay? Or a head boy. 
So um, just remember that. So it's not the fact that you did Duke of Edinburgh that is like exciting, which is great, you know, but for top universities, it's more about, because everybody, almost everyone does Duke of Edinburgh. Um, so it's really about why, you know, how is this different for you? How, um, what are the challenges that you had to face and how did you, you know, how did you deal with those challenges? Interest in specific um, university, what has attracted you to study at this university, given that is offered by lots of different universities, what is it about studying at that appeals to you? What contribution do you feel you would make to the student community? So yeah, they could ask you why you want to come to this university. So like you apply for a job, you need to know the organization you work with, you've got to do some research about the organization. But never say that I want to come to university because you've got a great sport, unless you're applying to like uh, Loughborough, which has a great sporting facility. Um, I wouldn't never say it's because of your social activities and, you know, you're talking to academics. So it's really got to be about the academic context of that university. Um, or you can talk about uh, the city itself, or you can do a two part answer. So you could talk about the academic and the city. Um, but I wouldn't put on the social. I mean, every university has fantastic social anyway uh, and it's not like you're a home student and it matters which location you go to right um uh, unless you're, you're you're just adamant to go to london for example but it really doesn't matter for international students in that context um medical interviews there are two types this panel interview and the mmi interview so panel is normally 40 minutes asked by two to three tutors M multiple mini interviews is like speed dating so you've got station uh 10 station after every station you have 10 minutes to answer a question the bell rings you move on to the next station. Um, so panel interview question, should someone sell their kidney? At what point is a person dead? Should abortion be illegal? How can you measure the weight of a person's liver without performing any invasive procedure? You may also be asked to describe a slide or extract information from a graph or table. At what point is a person dead? Somebody actually said, when the doctor tells me. I mean, that's just a ridiculous answer. Um, so you've got to be very, very careful of being able to think on your feet for these type of questions. Um, again, for other courses, it could be things like abstract questioning, like I give you hundred pounds, you must offer part of it to someone. If they reject the offer, you get nothing. How much do you offer? That's economics. How hot does the air have to be in a hot air balloon if I want to use it to lift an elephant? Uh, material science, what does it mean to take another's car? Law, which person in the past would you most like to interview and why? History, how many grains of sand are there in the world? Physics, what is the point of using NHS money to keep all people alive? Medicine, does a snail have a consciousness? Experimental psychology. So again, all these, you know, that sometimes it's not about getting the last answer or the final answer, it's about how you think through the process of getting to that answer. So these are abstract questions. Not every question in Oxbridge is going to be abstract. There's obviously going to be a lot more spe specific specialist questions, but they tend to be questions which are quite abstract, throw you off your feet, really. Uh, it's all about higher order thinking skills. So the more you can think out of the box and try to extrapolate that thinking along so that you can deal with any questions thrown at you, really. <coughs> you can also be given a graph. So for example, natural science, which is my degree, um, summarize the graph, what defines a mammal, what do the deviation from the line show, can brain size relative to body size tell us anything about intelligence, are there any flaws in this study, what body weight does the dog have. So it's really what they're looking for is a root of discussion. How do you discuss these things with your interview? Remember, they're looking for teachable students, they want to be able to teach you. So you have to engage in a discussion, um, but also you need to understand how to answer these questions outside of your syllabus. This is not going to be in your textbook, or it could be a history question where they say, what do you find interesting about it? When do you think the map was made? Where is it from? What is it showing? What message does it communicate? What does the name of the map suggest? How could this be relevant today? This is definitely not going to be in your history um, textbook. And I just want to share with you very quickly the do's and don'ts for your interview. So do's, know your subject, reread your personal statement, because they're going to ask you that again, research about your course, university and interviewers, enter the room confidently, introduce yourself, especially if you're doing online, you need to have a really good expressive face, otherwise it gets um, lost, the vibe is not there. 
maintain eye contact with all interviews, not just with the person who was asked the question. Look interested, obviously. If you don't understand the question asked, but don't guess. Um, it, the more hints they give you to answer a question, especially in Oxbridge, the less likely you get the offer. Okay, so the more hints they give you, they're really looking for people who um, can really think on their feet without having too many hints. Uh, remember, showing your thought process is more important than knowing the correct answer. Be polite, friendly, and always smile. Um, if you can, I know some people find that difficult, some kids find that difficult, but try to smile. Don't go into giggly position, but just smile and be professional. Uh, don't cross your arms. It makes you look reserved, confrontational. Of course, in person, if you slouch, that's also a, pro a problem. Ask the interviewers personal or irrelevant questions. Swear, I'm sure none of you will do that. Uh, criticize a past superior teacher. Yeah, this is something has come up in the, uh, one or two interviews where the kid, um, you know, the interviewer said, oh, your reference talks about something where you are developing your skill. Um, uh, what do you have to say about that? And then the student just went on on blasting about their teacher. Remember that the teaching professions are very, you know, it's a very professional profession. Everybody respects each other. Um, and you may disagree with um, your teachers or you may want to put the blame on the rest of the world, um, but they're looking at accountability to be yours. So, so you've got to come across, this is my accountability, this is where I'm developing, and the more genuine you are, the better it is. Um, don't fidget with the hair, with nails, clothes, or slouch in your chair. Don't draw attention to your weaknesses, as I said earlier on. Don't be thrown by the unexpected questions. Stay calm, try to figure it out, take a second, try to figure out what the question is and work out a process to answer that question. Don't be thrown by that unexpected question. Don't think, oh my God, is the end of my world now. And remember, the more you go into this thinking, I need to get this offer. I definitely need to get this offer. Otherwise, it's the end of my kind of thing. And this is a message to the parents as well. Um, I think kids have so much expectation and of course um, they can see that you are putting a lot of effort on, on them to provide them the resources and sometimes they carry the burden that I've got to achieve this. If I don't achieve this, I have failed myself, I failed my family. Uh, the problem with that kind of uh, burden is that when they go for the interview, they're no longer enjoying the process and therefore they're just gunning for the outcome and they'll unlikely to get those offers that is why you've got kids I mean I had a boy I had two boys one who had fantastic GCSE results straight A stars top student in the in the in the whole in the whole country had the best sixth form prize um absolutely wonderful student top a whole you know I think his whole life he was a top student and this other boy came in with average um, uh, sort of uh, form five results um, average student I remember his first personal statement he said I've always been average in my life um, uh, and then he got into Cambridge Trinity College to study computer science and the other young man didn't uh, and that's because he went in without the pressure of the outcome he went in because he was just like hell I've got nothing to lose I might as well just try um, and he yeah, he, he had nothing to lose and he got it. Sometimes, obviously, it's an element of luck as well. But, you know, it it because it, it, it's luck on the day, right, and how you perform. But I have to say that I have seen more and more kids uh, doing better um, if they go in with like, okay, look, I'm doing I'm going to try my best and see what happens, rather than I'm going, I've, you know, I've got all this burden on the world on my shoulder. Um, so um, have it a know it all attitude. There's so many people come across so like all overconfident, even if they're not overconfident, but the manner that they speak, they come across as if they are overconfident. Um, and that does throw the admission to the, the panel interviews. Remember, they're looking for people they can teach. Um, don't be discouraged. So if you get rejected by one university, do not be discouraged for your next interview. Don't ever, 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 ever give up. So you know, you can always reapply the following year. I've had students this year reapplied, didn't get into Cambridge last year, reapplied this year, got into Cambridge. I had a boy who reset the year, AS year. Um, you know, in any other school, he would be discouraged in applying to Cambridge. He applied, got into architecture um, for Cambridge. So, you know, there's never, ever give up. Um, so, yeah, I think that should bring um to the final bit now so i just wanted to say uh it, you know if you need any help at all with any of your uh this is for the external students um if you you know 
if you're applying to OIC, that's great. Um, if you're not, um, because you're not given an offer or because you do not want to come to OIC and you want some help externally, then we do have the OIC Academy where we would help with university consulting, uh, as well as uh, coaching around super curricula, um, you know, including finding your work experiences, also personal statement, interview preparation, um, all that thing to, to strategize your application. Then we're very, very help, happy to help external students uh, who are not part of the OIC um, community. So we're very happy to do so. I'm actually doing a number of consultancies um, with external students. So if you would like uh, to take part in that, uh, please do so. Otherwise, if you're applying to OIC, uh, all the best with your application. But I'm just going to see if I can take some questions now uh, to see if anyone, if you want to come off mute and you want to ask any questions, by all means, please do so. I'm an encyclopedia, so, um, right, may I know how do you structure the personal statement, please? So if you're already at the stage of structuring personal statement, as opposed to uh, building the evidence of your personal statement, then um, the way you structure your personal statement is that is, first of all, you have to work out the theme. What is the theme of your personal statement? Uh, what is the flow? Like, it depends on what you're doing. If, uh, it I think it's Jack. Jack, if you can just tell me what's, what's your course, what are you planning to apply for? I'm assuming you're already at the stage where you're submitting application rather than building evidence. Um, so Jack, if you can just write what you're applying for. Uh, for economic what are some beneficial extracurricular activities that I can take part in? For economics degree, it's really about wider reading. And yes, you can take part in work experience, for example, investment banking, uh, GOP Morgan, HSBC, there are a number of um, work experiences related to economics. Wider reading is very important. And then essay writing, because those are the super curricular activities that I would recommend. I think you mean super curricular rather than extracurricular. Um, uh, would have loved to... I would have loved to apply to OIC, but my boy is only 14, so cannot qualify. Um, well, uh, we do a one-year uh, GCSE program. I would say he should be 15 um, before I apply. Otherwise, you could obviously come uh, apply for A-levels as well. Um, but even if he's only 14, I have I have some students in year 10, year 9, year 10, who've already started the university preparation. So if you're looking for that kind of university coaching journey, by all means, we can help with that. Uh, format, medicine, Jack. Okay, so for medicine, you've got to start off with the first paragraph, why medicine? So how you answer why medicine? What does medicine mean to you? And what's triggered you to want to do medicine? And then you follow on with the second paragraph about your work experiences, your wider reading, again, bringing in the flow and the theme. And the best thing to do is, as I said, have those blogs of all the things that you have done and then choose the rich, the richer content to demonstrate. If you need some help around that, uh, we can help you to be able to choose the best content to, to structure your personal statement. Um, but then the second and the third paragraph is normally a combination of your work experience, voluntary work, um, wider reading, projects and competitions, and so on. Um, the main thing also in your med in medical personal statement is you have to show case studies as well. So case studies are what you have observed uh, during your work experience. Uh, so that could be um, that could be case studies. So for example, if you saw a diabetic patient, or if you saw um, Alzheimer's, so again, you have to describe that because you have to show at least minimum of two case studies. Is there a minimum age limit for the university admission for medicine? Yes. Um, uh, so some universities will not allow below 18. Uh, for other courses, no. But if they're too young, they will also look into safeguarding. There's a safeguarding policies. But generally, there's no minimum age limit um, for other courses apart from medicine and dentistry. So normally there's an 18. Uh, you have to, you know, some universities, you have to be 18 at the start of your course or you have to be 18 by the second term. Um, does essay writing help with psychology as well? Definitely. Definitely. In any case, for essay for psychology and economics and uh, the social science and commerce uh, group, that career group, you probably, if you're applying to Oxbridge, you also have a written assessment that you have to provide them as well. So that written, so Oxford normally asks for three, Cambridge asks for two. So you have to actually give in your written assessment. What sort of recommended activities I should participate if I'm applying to computer science? So computer programming, C, Java, uh, Python. 
how do you, you know, that those are the kind of like computer programming that you need to do projects and competitions take part in that. Bebras computing challenge, for example, that's a really good one. If you would, if you would like to speak to me, um, direct message me. Um, oh, that's from Britannia, sorry. Um, yeah, so I, I mean, if you want to have a chat with me, if you want to connect with me, by all means, you can email. Um, I will uh, uh, post my email address, or obviously you can go through Britannia as well. Um, yeah, so happy to help uh, with anything. If you want any consultancy, or if you want anything um, to, to that, um, that's fine. Um, what are some, what supercurriculars can I do if I'm planning on applying for physics? Wider reading. Uh, there are some work experience in physics as well. I had a student who got to the Diamond Trust, which is a very good uh, work experience for physics or the Rutherford Laboratory, which is a really good one as well. Um, but wider reading and then taking part in engineering type of projects and then bringing out the physics context from that. Um, Extracurricular activities, I think you mean supercurricular for medicine, uh, Shashvina. So those are, again, uh, work experience, voluntary work, and so on. Um, Abby, he got penny star for IGCSE last year, but only turned 15 this October. Um, tried applying to Cardiff, but too young. I'm no longer at Cardiff, so if you're looking at Cardiff, I'm no longer there. I'm at OIC, or I'm doing the university consultancies. Um, but um, yeah, so only, yeah, so 15, um, um, well, I think if you're turning 15 in October, it is actually um, fine. You could, um, we will accept that for A-levels actually, Abby. So that, that should be fine. Um, for year 10 students, what are some things we can do to prepare to apply for sixth form college? Admission test, admission test, work experience, wider reading, uh, wider reading in particular, admission test, uh, admission test, not in the context currently as it is, but just the building blocks. I mean, I'm training some of the kids from year nine, actually. If I had a school from year eight and onwards, it would be absolutely amazing because I can build that thread rather than, you know, giving them all the stress in year 12. Any age limit for pharmacology or biochemistry courses? No, no. Um, it is never early to start your personal statement. I'm finishing year 11 and I do not know whether to start with my personal statement. No, you should not start with your personal statement. You should continue building the blocks for your personal statement. It's not finalized yet. Don't think it's finalized, You're still building the blocks, but it's great that you're already starting looking at the building blocks. Um, I think we're running out of time. I'm getting our messages that we're running out of time. Would medicine allow retakes for AS level exam? Uh, yes and no, it depends how you present your case. Um, I think I would say no, uh, but it, it's, it's presentation, it's really presentation. Um, okay, fantastic. Um, Ronald, um, are you we... Sorry? <laughs> I hope I've been able to answer all the questions, <laughs> but um, but yeah, look, I'm really apolo apologies at the beginning uh, for uh, the fire drill that I had to go through in my hotel. As I said, I'm in Middle East at the moment doing university interviews, um, I'm visiting a few schools here. Um, but um, uh, yeah, look, if anyone has any other questions, I put my email address. Please email me if you want to talk to us. As I said, we do a lot of um, things for external students, so we're very happy to help external students as well. Yep, if you have Hi, yes, questions, me. sorry. Uh, Ronald, uh, yes, uh -huh. this is uh, Suzama here. I am Moira's mom who's- Oh, hello, from... hi. Hi, hi. Um, uh, we are glad that we sent Moira there. Uh, the, I just wanted to know uh, something extra, you know, regarding the BMAT and the UK CAT exam. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you go through with the students when they are there, right? Do you have an yeah, external so, for that as well? So, so um, the admission test classes starts from January. So they learn yeah. the admission test skills for BMAT and UCAT. And in the post-exam activity, they will have further sessions for BMAT and UCAT. And then we will continue those sessions 
questions when they return for the UCAS August program. Um, and then, of course, in September leading up to November, they will then continue with their BMAT. By then, they would have done their UCAT. So the timeline is admission test classes from January onwards, then post exam activities, they have workshops uh, given by external providers on UCAT and BMAT. And then they will have UCAS August program in August, where they will do further BMAT and UCAT. And then by then, I think they would have done all their UCAT, and then BMAT will continue until November. Thank you, Yasmin. Thank no you. <laughs> Uh, may I know, do you prepare for BMAT? Yes, we prepare for all admission tests. Um, so definitely. Um, how do you prepare? Um, how do we prepare for BMAT? First of all, we teach the knowledge, the skills that you need for BMAT and, and, and UCAT, and then the kids then subscribe to portals where they can practice on a daily basis. But you have to teach them first, otherwise they get into bad habits of answering and how to answer these questions. You just left, they, they just left to their own devices. Um, around when in the A-level program would we start writing personal statements no it's not about writing writing can be done like in two weeks or three weeks is the building the blocks that's so important that should start from straight away is that the same for the PAT yes for all admission tests we prepare for all admission tests because we have uh, could you please recommend me some portals for BMAT and UCAT tests I, I ha happy to recommend the only problem with recommending uh, portals is that if you if you rely too much on the portals and you're not taught the right um, structure on how to answer these questions you end up picking up bad habits and that's what I've noticed with a lot of students but send me an email I'm more than happy to uh, recommend you some portals okay I think we've got to end there but yeah. brilliant thank you so much yeah. Ronald. if you have any questions yeah please feel free to email Yasmin or myself and um yep yeah, thank you for joining us today yeah I'll just put my email address again Okay. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Yes. Thank Fantastic. you. Everyone.